happy to be in front of uh, you guys. Uh, it's actually so close to my heart that it's a great day for me today. And also because, of course, for those who live in Singapore, you know, uh, phase two uh, is starting today. So uh, it's uh, two big reasons for, for a great day. Okay. Um, so what is the agenda for today? Today, we're going to look at brands and audience impacted during the COVID, right? So, so the, the big picture is looking at behaviors and consumption patterns uh, that have happened during COVID. And I'm gonna explain you why and how in a minute. Okay, so moving to next. So that's what I said. We're gonna look at brand performance, audience impact. And of course, there will be room for your questions at the end. Uh, I'm gonna go quite quickly through a lot of data. So feel free to ask questions whenever you want. Quick introduction about myself. Who is this French guy? Um, I've been a student at ESSEC a long, long time ago now, uh, 98 to 2002. And I was uh, privileged enough to um, live in Singapore for one year. Uh, the end of ESSAC. At that time, there was no campus uh, in Singapore, uh, but, but still I had chosen Singapore um, to, to yeah, do my last inter internship. I worked at Nielsen after that. For those who don't, all of you who don't know, um, it's, a, it's a market research company. Uh, and this is where I started my career. And since then, I've always um, remained uh, a fervent believer of market research. Um, I started in a um, uh, basis division, uh, yeah, working for Unilever mainly, and then I was uh, in charge of pricing and portfolio for Europe. And then this company, uh, whom I had never known of, uh, contacted me called YouGov, uh, UK Market Research, um, and asked me to uh, start uh, the French operations uh, in Paris. So I became the CEO of, of myself, actually, in France. I grew the team for a few years, uh, then added um, Spain and Italy as new, new markets. Uh, and I joined um, the region uh, two years ago, where we had been established for about five years. This is about me and enough about me. Now, I'm going to move quickly uh, about uh, talking about YouGov, what is YouGov, who is YouGov, and how are we uh, collecting all the data uh, and gathering the information you're going to see later. So we are a data and analytics company, and the principle is very simple. We have online panels, proprietary panels across the world uh, in 44 countries, to be very accurate, uh, close to 10 million of people, and we are gathering information about those panelists on a continuous basis, right? So it's either specific surveys, studies for specific projects, but we also have a continuous stream of data coming to us because we are basically asking questions every day. Uh, and, and the good point of, about having 10 million panelists is you don't need to ask everyone a question every day, of course, so we, we kind of switch uh, between people. Uh, just to give you a, an example, um, we interviewed uh, 14, 40 million people um, last year uh, only. So we really have a lot of data. And of course, we keep this data, we keep track of this data. So in some markets, we have more than 10 years of history uh, of data around brands, for instance. I'm not going to talk into details about what we're doing, but basically, when once you get this data, there's several ways uh, you can distribute the data. You can either um, do a pop on presentation, but we have a lot of tools that actually give you access real time to this data. So most of our clients are actually accessing the data real time and manipulating the, the data themselves. You might have heard about YouGov. YouGov is not as big as the others, Nielsen, Ipsos, and so on, but we are very, very active on, on, the, on the media and news side, uh, the most quoted uh, research agency in the UK, and we are tackling a lot of topics. Uh, um, we are not only tackling business topics, but we're doing uh, political, uh, public opinion overall, uh, and this is what allows us to be, to be published um, across the globe and in the region in particular. Okay. 
Enough uh, about YouGov, and now let's go uh, through what we have uh, collected uh, during uh, the COVID uh, and across the globe. Um, so the way we are positioned during COVID is our priority is to serve the, the public good. We are collecting a, a, a lot of data, uh, and this data is mostly um, dedicated to our public um, instances, public institutions, governments, uh, and we want to also give everyone the ability to have uh, a free access uh, to this data. What kind of data are we collecting? Uh, we are collecting behavioral data uh, about public health um, and about uh, symptoms, behaviors, uh, and this data is really dedicated to uh, those uh, public organizations and policy makers. Uh, we are working very closely with the Imperial College in London, and this data is actually used to um, study the pattern of those behaviors, right? Are, are people um, following the public policies? Are they wearing a mask? Um, are they likely to, to do that in the future? Uh, are they happy about it or not, right? So this is really meant to, um, to observe, actually, the application of the public policies, but also to adapt uh, the speech when you're uh, one of those institutions. We've got a whole lot of data as well that is dedicated to the public, you, everyone, every one of us. Uh, it's um, accessible on our, on our website uh, and we're tracking a lot of countries uh, about those, those behaviors. And of course, we are still a business company, so there's a lot of this data that we'd be uh, selling to our uh, customers uh, and clients uh, across the globe. Okay, so today, we're going to look at two kind of um, pieces of information. One is um, a global tracker specifically focused on COVID-19. And we've been running this tracker actually starting in Asia since February, right? So we ask questions around COVID uh, every week. Uh, and we are asking those questions now in something like 29 markets. But as I said previously, we are also collecting data on a lot of other topics, right? On behaviors, on brand consumption, and it's been the case for years and years. So what we're gonna show you uh, in the next few slides is a combination of those data, how, how this, uh, let's say, um, traditional kind of collection of data, um, how is the brand story that we have been collecting for years impacted uh, by, by the COVID. Okay, so first let's look at brands uh, and a few examples uh, across the globe. Um, the first point, and, and you guys have been uh, for sure very exposed to that, uh, is brands are communicating a lot uh, during, uh, during COVID. Uh, and actually a lot of the people, um, this is the UK data, uh, believe that brands are over communicating. So, so first information for, for most of the marketeers, uh, be careful about over communication and, and people are, uh, are claiming and, and showing that, that they've had a bit enough, right? Also on top of the, the frequency or the, the amount of uh, communication, there's the content itself, right? So a lot of, of, the, of the consumers of the population, actually it's 43% of the total population, believe that those messages are not authentic. So especially during COVID, we hear a lot about this word so much and probably too much. We have to be very careful about the, the authenticity, sorry, of the message. Then more specifically, uh, what are uh, consumers fed up of? Uh, they're fed up about some of those expressions that I think we've been all guilty to use a lot not only as marketeers, but also in a daily communication. So we are all in this together, um, unprecedented. Uh, it's gonna be the new normal. Uh, of course, those messages are, are um, resonating a uh, bit negatively at the moment. I might add, uh, stay safe because, uh, okay, let's stay safe, but at some point uh, it's been too much. So something to keep in mind, and of course that we are tracking uh, over time. Okay, now let's go into uh, the uh, specific examples of brands and how brands have communicated during COVID. So first one is a UK insurance. Um, you might 
know this brand. I didn't know, but uh, the brand is called Admiral. Uh, it's an auto insurance brand. And what they've, what they've said actually during COVID, so, so around April, you can see uh, the dates uh, at the bottom of the chart, is that they would actually uh, give some cash back to everyone because during lockdown, you drive less. So you drive less, you should be paying less. And those calls are, are actually buzz calls. So this is the question is, have you heard something positive or negative about the brand? And this is a net score. So this is the net positive score. And you can see the buzz scores are rocketing high, right? So the minute they announce that they will be uh, giving money back, a uh, very uh, targeted message, very on purpose, uh, very to the point, the impact, uh, the impact is, is huge. Uh, so you can see that on the purple line. Uh, the, the pink line is the average of the rest of the insurance sector. And you can see this effect was only um, uh, for, for this brand. Quick aparte on this one. The way we do that, as I said, is we are asking questions about hundreds, hundreds of brands uh, around the globe every day. So it just allows us to track the very uh, meaningful events and the specific date started that could have had an impact on anything on the brand, right? On the buzz, on the on purchase intent, uh, whatever uh, you might want to track. So moving on now to another example, bear with me. Oh yes, sorry. Uh, not only the buzz has been impacted, but a lot of other measures, right? Attention, word of mouth, and as you can guess, customer satisfaction. So of course, the point is not only to generate buzz, but to influence those metrics that will have a, an impact on your brand, uh, brand image, or, or also um, uh, purchasing that or consideration. Another uh, example closer to us, uh, Prudential in Singapore. Uh, Prudential in Singapore have announced, as many uh, other insurance companies, that they would be supported those infected with the virus. But they went beyond that. They actually said they would be supported all those affected by the, by the virus. Those who have to stay at home because a, a family member has been infected, uh, those who have had an impact in their job. Uh, and this message has resonated very positively among, among the population. If you can see uh, the purple line, and uh, this is for Prudential, same the bus score. So basically, did you hear something positive about this brand? Yes, significantly about Prudential. And you can see all the big insurances in Singapore also have communicated, generated some positive effect, but less so than Prudential. What do, oh, of course, always forget the animations. Uh, buzz is fine, but of course, they also manage to generate um, uh, positive, positivity around attention, reputation, and very important for them and all brands, uh, purchase intent. What do we have next? Supermarket in Singapore as well, Shang Xiong. Um, what they did is actually in Q1, uh, as, uh, as many companies, they shared their uh, financial statements and they announced they were making a lot of profit. Uh, they were able to make a lot of profit because consumption were, was good, uh, Chinese New Year, all of that had, had a very positive impact on their numbers. And when, when COVID started to hit um, uh, the region more uh, um, significantly, they announced that they would share those profits with their employees. And again here, you can see the impact on bus uh, very clear, very immediate, and, and of course, way higher uh, the sector uh, average in Singapore. And here, even more so, uh, the impact has been massive on their uh, uh, KPIs, right? Impression, which is what you think about the brand, reputation uh, as, an, as, a, as a potential employee, would you be proud or, or not to work for this company? and recommendation, would you recommend the brand to, to anyone? Uh, very, very massive impact and thus uh, very well done to uh, them. Another example uh, of, of uh, the, the, this daily tracking and how actually brands have leveraged uh, the, the COVID-19 um, period. 
uh, back in the day, so back in the days, back, uh, about two years ago, uh, there was a royal commission uh, that issued a very negative report on Australian banks. Uh, so it was around March uh, 2018. Uh, you can see that this report had a negative effect uh, on the big four uh, banks. So big four brands, CBA, ANZ, NAB, and Westpac. The buzz went down, the reputation went down, the impression went down. But during COVID, uh, those banks announced that they will actually um, implement some measures uh, to support and give incentives around mortgages, loans, uh, and help people actually in this uh, difficult situation. So very positive impact. And, and as you can see, this is only now actually, so two years after the Royal Commission, that those banks come back to where they were uh, before uh, the very negative um, buzz impact and reputation impact of the, the commission. As buzz never works alone, you can, you can see as well that it had an impact on value, on quality of the services, on customer satisfaction, and on recommendations. So those messages uh, really matter and those uh, commercial strategies actually were uh, very uh, successful. Last example, I think, uh, in terms of, of the brands themselves, actually not last, there's, a, there's another one after that, is uh, going to Europe this time, so Germany. Uh, in Germany, uh, the government set up some measures uh, and said that actually the small businesses would benefit from rent cuts, right? So uh, the fact that um, those who are um, street retailers um, would have to pay less or no rent. Big brands announced or, or were known to take advantage of, of those cuts. And you can see in green what happened to Adidas when, when people found out that they would stop paying their rent and benefit from this measure. The buzz score went crazy low, right? This is a huge decrease uh, on the Adidas side and actually the others as well, right? But Adidas was more frontline uh, in this, uh, in this um, event. Later on, uh, around early May, those big brands announced that actually no, they would not, um, they would refuse to benefit from the, the government subsidy, but it was too late. It was too late and not enough. Uh, they are not going back to where they were. Uh, and it's also something very important to measure, right? The buzz is happening all the time. Whatever a brand is saying, whatever happens in the market that is probably out of their control, uh, there will be a positive or a negative buzz. That's fine. But the key question is actually how positive or how negative it is and how long does it last? How long does it last before I come back to normal? Does that affect actually what people think about me or what people consider uh, in their, in their uh, purchasing patterns? Okay. Uh, this one I'll be quite quick on, on this chart, but this is just to show you actually that what I was showing um, so far is very big picture, right? Very big picture about what people think and so on. But then you can you can do a deep dive uh, and, and look at specific audiences in particular. So let's say, uh, what, who are those current customers of Adidas who have a positive impression of the brands? And you can you can dig further and look at. What, what sports they follow, what um, actually club they are fans of, Bayern Munter, and you can, as you can imagine, uh, what they are interested in and so on. And this as a marketer will give you the ability uh, to, to kind of fine tune your message, right? To craft your message to the right audience uh, and see um, um, how to actually target better those, um, those groups. Uh, last, this time is the last one, the last brand example, uh, McDonald's in Singapore. Uh, those again who live in Singapore, you've heard, heard that uh, Singapore had to close, uh, McDonald's, sorry, had to close uh, all their restaurants because uh, one of their staff was infected. And actually, uh, you can see, of course, that this had, this has had an impact on everyone, right? When you hear that a brand is closing 
uh, their restaurants uh, for health reasons, uh, everybody wa wa was concerned. Actually, those who are afraid of the COVID, but also those who are not afraid uh, of the COVID. Then what McDonald's did is they actually, uh, despite the new phase of, of circuit breaker, they've waited to reopen their restaurant. They've said, we are not going to reopen. Now we want to wait a little bit further. And you can see that this has been received very positively by the population, again, by everyone. Uh, but this was a smart move from, from McDonald's, actually. As I said, the buzz is going to be very reactive, right? Whatever you say, whatever appears in the press, the buzz is going to move up or down. But then if you look at those metrics that are harder to, uh, to leverage, uh, like consideration, purchase intent, you can actually see that during the closure of the restaurant, uh, the, the consideration didn't go down that much. Uh, it didn't go down that much. Of course, naturally, people would less consider to go. They could, they could actually not. Uh, but then again, with the, the smart move and, and actually a uh, very um, sensible move, uh, the consideration went back up and, and, it, and is uh, currently at the same level as it was before the closure of those restaurants. Same here, uh, we can look at, uh, at, at, the, um, at the consumers, at the population through different segments. Uh, and if you want to have more insights about who are those Singaporeans who are afraid of contracting the, the COVID-19, uh, you can see that they are more likely to say that the government uh, should, should uh, play a dominant role in the economy. Uh, they support and they are more, more, more likely to support the surveillance to fight crime. Uh, they are following the S League more than others. Um, they are more likely to consider Pizza Hut, for instance, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So again, what we are trying to, to bring uh, to light with this data is not only the big picture trends, but then the way we can differentiate the, those audiences, the, the way we can describe them uh, in a more granular way, right? It's not only about age or where you live, but it, it's, it's actually about what you think. Uh, what brands you buy, uh, what kind of media you are consuming as well. Um, and you can go a bit deeper into that, right? The financial uh, attributes, uh, they are investing. They believe that investing is too risky. They prefer to invest in gold and, and, and watches and wine, for instance. So all of that is going to also help uh, to craft a message if you want to address this specific segment of the population. And they, of course, believe that being insured for everything is important or more. They believe that more than the others. Okay, now we've looked at brands or specific brands in particular. Uh, we can also look at the total sector. How do we do that? Well, in a given sector, we'll always be tracking about 30 brands uh, and we just aggregate, aggregate the data, sorry. So from left to right, uh, you have um, scores uh, starting uh, from December to, to last month to May. Uh, and you can see that some sectors have suffered during COVID, right? Some se sectors have been more affected in terms of likelihood to purchase. Airlines, as you can guess, uh, are, have been massively affected. You can see the, the difference between December and January. Automotive as well, uh, the, the market has suffered. Uh, very, very clearly, uh, fashion retailers, uh, personal care as well, right? We, we, a lot of, of people communicated a lot on, on the fact that, that retail was doing well, uh, that e-commerce was actually doing well, actually not all categories, right? Personal care, well, when you're stuck at home, uh, you are less likely to be willing to, to buy a personal care items uh, and you probably need them a bit less uh, when you are isolated. But this pattern is not true for all sectors. So again, in Indonesia in particular, uh, we saw an increase uh, um, in, uh, cook in interest for interest and likelihood to purchase cooking in ingredients, household care, clean your house more. Uh, internet, it's a, it's a big sector as well. You've got the likes of Facebook, TikTok, and so on. So of course, much more uh, attention and usage in those sectors. Uh, and, and finance, uh, in particular, insurances. 
right? So not all sectors have been equal during COVID. And, and of course, the data will be a bit different from uh, one market to another, in particular in terms of timing, right? There's a, a clear impact on, 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 of the timing itself uh, of the lockdown. Okay, so enough about the brands. Now we're going to move to uh, something uh, more uh, broad, actually, uh, in terms of what what population think and feel during COVID, right? So how is it affect affecting, sorry, their health and the perception of, of the future? Uh, how do we collect this information? Uh, quickly told you uh, a bit before, but we are actually interviewing people uh, in 29 countries, I think about 10 in APAC, um, and we are um, interviewing the, those people every week because we want to be able to track those changes when, when um, external events happen, right? So the data we're going to see uh, has been collected um, since February, and we're going to look at the last five waves. So what happened between May the 4th and early June. Okay, so this first one is a, is a broad question about what people feel about the situation. Is the situation, according to you, getting better or getting worse? Getting better in blue-green, getting worse in pink? You can see that actually the, the the responses, the answers across markets are quite different, but two of them stand out, um, India and Indonesia, uh, where we have a majority of the population telling us that the situation is getting worse. And, and then it's gonna span between five and 20%, uh, depending uh, on the countries, right? So Singapore is at 15, Hong Kong is at 15 on, on getting worse, but the, the majority of the markets are really seeing an improvement and are confident that the situation is, is improving, uh, except India and Indonesia. Bear with me. So if we do a deep dive into Indonesia, and we look at those people that are concerned that the situation is getting worse. Who are they, right? Who are they and how do they compare? So there are, uh, their numbers or their data is expressed in, in red and they are compared to those who are um, um, thinking that the situation is getting better. They are a majority of women. There's more women that uh, believe the situation is getting worse. And if you think about it in Indonesia, a lot of the sectors where women are overrepresented in terms of, of the workforce, manufacturing, textile, and so on, those sectors have been badly and, and, and severely affected, right? So it, it makes sense that, 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 that women are more worried. It's not the case in all markets, right? In some markets, uh, men are, are much more worried. The younger you are, the more worried you are, actually, which is not common as well, right? There's a lot of markets where actually the younger population is much less worried about the situation and the future, but in Indonesia, uh, the, the, the younger folks are more worried. And in terms of level of education, it's, it's across the board, whether you went to, to university or not, uh, you, you are um, uh, more worried, right? Uh, I'm not gonna give you all the details, but again, it gives you a picture of, of those dynamics. Um, of course, uh, something that has been um, circulating a lot in the press is uh, the damage on the economy itself. So we've seen health, but now we're talking about the economy. Uh, a lot of articles are quantifying the impact, uh, the impact uh, in terms of uh, whether there will be a recession, how bad it is, is it going to be, uh, how much the economy is going to shrink. So. Of course, those news are affecting um, what the population thinks, uh, but not only, not only those news, uh, there, there's clear effects, uh, visible effects on, on the economy uh, today. So when we ask people what they think uh, uh, and if, they, if they, there will be a recession in the next 12 months, uh, actually the, the majority of people uh, think that there would be a recession, right? Across the whole region, of APAC and MENA as well, actually much more in APAC than in MENA, as you can see, 
because in APAC we are ranging between 50 and 70 percent of the population. The exception uh, in Asia is China. Actually, uh, the Chinese are much more optimistic uh, about uh, about the economy and about the rebound uh, of the economy. Uh, and actually, other markets uh, in our region are, are, are quite pessimistic. Hong Kong is the most pessimistic with 79% uh, expecting a recession and, and, and just behind Singapore, Thailand and Malaysia uh, are also uh, in the 65 to 70%. When we ask, uh, when, we, when we display the other parts of the question, which is um, what percent of people believe actually that the economies will be growing uh, in the upcoming years, uh, you can see actually that very few people believe that. Uh, again, uh, much more optimism uh, in UAE and KSA, uh, optimism in China. And to give you a benchmark, because we're asking those questions across the globe, uh, this number uh, rises to 25% in the US. So uh, there, there's no clear link probably in, in uh, how you feel about the economy and the actual health situation in, in the country, because the US is still uh, a country where uh, there are a lot of cases uh, and we can't say it's, it's under, under control, yet uh, the population is much more optimistic than in Asia, where in a lot of the markets, actually the, the epidemic, uh, the pandemic has been, has been controlled very well. Um, a bit uh, further on this topic, so how do you think uh, that your uh, activity, the business activity at your place of work has been affected. Again, here, I'm not gonna th go through all those numbers, but uh, it's very clear that the, the, the activity has been reducing. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's much clearer when you look at the data in Indonesia or in India, back to what we were saying uh, in terms of the confidence in the future, uh, but it's really uh, across the board. Uh, those who are actually saying less that, that the activity has decreased are China, Australia, uh, and even Hong Kong, right? If you think about uh, the, the lockdown in Hong Kong, uh, the country has, ne the, the market has never been uh, in, a, in a full lockdown. So, so of course, if you look around you and people are going back to the office, uh, you have, um, you are less likely to say there's been a decrease in the activity. Um, Job security, uh, again, as you can imagine, uh, people are not very optimistic about their jobs, but where is it that people feel the less secure uh, about, about the future, about their jobs? Uh, there's Thailand, 49%. 49 there's UAE, uh, the, the Emirates, uh, 56% actually. Uh, and uh, we, we can see that actually the rest of, of, um, of APAC and, and MENA is between 35 and 45 percent. Again, here uh, more optimism, optimism uh, in China and in Australia, where only 22 percent and 71 percent of the people um, feel less secure uh, about their job. Uh, this one uh, is also to show uh, that there's not only negative uh, during the COVID, and actually the situation is improving and the perception is improving as well, right? So we are tracking uh, those, those, um, those sentiments uh, on a weekly basis. And you can see that actually in some markets, um, we have a stability in the, in the situation. Actually, the situation is improving, right? In Australia and China, uh, because the situation has been controlled or started earlier in China, there's more optimism, optimism now. Uh, in terms of, of the future and the safety on jobs. If you compare that now to Singapore, you can see it's not the case yet in Singapore. And again, it's quite easy to understand, right? The, the circuit breaker has just ended. We are just starting to consider resuming business activities on, on, a, on a broad range. Uh, and of course, there's still a, a lot of concerns about uh, job security, right? How is the economy? going to bounce back? Uh, how are we going to compensate um, those who have been affected? And actually how fast will we be able to reopen uh, to, um, uh, to um, go back to something that would be closer to normal? If we 
same thing as earlier with Indonesia, but if we do a deep dive into Singapore uh, and we want to understand who are those people concerned about job security, uh, we can see here this time that males are more concerned than, than females, 43% versus 39. And this is the other way around in terms of, uh, of uh, generation, right? So the baby boomers are actually much more concerned than the millennials. Um, and in terms of work status, it tends to affect more those who are working part-time and, and we can uh, easily understand that. People are also more worried uh, about uh, being able to pay for everyday essentials. Uh, and of course, uh, they are claiming that they are spending less, for instance, on online purchases, right? They are, they are trying to save or not be able to spend. We also ask another question, which is, Compared to one month ago, how has your household financial situation changed, right? And do you think that your situation has improved in purple or do you think that your situation is worse in pink? The majority, of course, are, of the markets that we are studying in APAC and MENA uh, are saying that the situation is, is getting worse or the situation is getting worse and worse, actually. But if you look at the trends, well, first of all, if you look at, uh, at, the, at the markets specifically, they don't have the same level of concern, right? Some, some are, are more concerned than, than others. Uh, but also the trend uh, is positive because we are asking this question every month. We can see actually that there's more and more people saying that the situation has improved every week, sorry. Uh, and there's less and less people saying that the situation is worse, right? So we are still not jumping uh, in the streets uh, and, and being very positive and happy about uh, all of that, uh, but, but it's getting better uh, and there's a bit more confidence uh, as we um, um, progress in the crisis. Other things again that we are covering and looking at and where you will see that there's differences across markets is actually how the COVID uh, context has changed uh, the behaviors. Uh, how is it, has it changed the behaviors in different areas, right? So a lot of people, of course, are, are saying that they have actively reduced their non-essential expenses, uh, relied more on savings, uh, some um, that uh, have taken on more debt to cover expenses. But you can see it's interesting to look at the, the differences across markets. So actually more Singaporeans and Malaysians are drawing on savings to cover expenses uh, as compared to the other countries. Um, the Indonesians are those who are the most likely uh, to have reduced non-essential non expenditure. It's about 70% of them. Uh, and there's also a large proportion of Thais and Indians who have taken on more debt. Last slide now, uh, deep dive into Australia. So how is it, how is the COVID going to change your behavior in terms of the lifestyle, right? So there's uh, of course a lot of, of change in, in how we are behaving today uh, and, and are trying to face the recession, uh, but also it's changed probably the perception that we have uh, of the world. We've got 74% uh, of the Australians who, who claim that they will support the local businesses much more. Uh, they are also saying that they will take more local holidays, right? There's a, a dual factor in that, a dual combination of the fact that, yeah, you can't really travel, so you have to, uh, to be more local, but there's also a need and, and, a, and a wish to support the local economy. Um, I'd be buying more green or sustain, sustainable produce, for instance. Uh, quite significant number of people, 50% will use cash less in the future. So interesting to see that. And again, it would be good to compare across markets. I can't wait to go on vacation holidays <laughs> overseas. <laughs> I'm sure it, it, it's applying to a lot of people <laughs> and a lot of people in Singapore in particular. Uh, but yeah, of course, there's a lot of people who are still considering and, and looking very much forward to go overseas uh, and so on and so forth. 
So this is the, the kind of data we are um, able to look at. Uh, I'm very happy to take questions and uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer uh, because my team is not around me, so I'll be uh, probably not able to go into too many details. Thank, okay. thank you very much, Julian. I mean, it was a really nice presentation. Uh, I think on a personal note, McDonald's holds a very close uh, part in my heart. And I was very, very happy when it finally reopened. Yes, that's oh. like signs of optimism, going back to normal. I want my Big Mac. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, we'll go into questions right now that we actually have. And I'll actually start off with uh, one of my own first. Uh, you talked actually earlier in your presentation about over communication uh, of brands to their target audiences. In your own personal opinion, do you think it's too many messages are going to the audience? Or is it maybe one message that's actually going to too many channels of communication to these audiences? In that case, what we were able to see, it's mostly that the content of the message was too similar, right? It was similar across the brands and people were just fed up because in terms of um, media activity actually and communication, it's not increased, right? It's not true that brands have been communicated more. Uh, and they, if anything, they've been communicating less actually because a lot of brands have cut uh, their, their advertising budget. The problem and the feedback from, from, from consumers were that the messages were all the same. We're all the same and for too much and probably too long on, on the same uh, theme. Um, so that, that's what we, we've been able to see. So another question that we have is, have you seen a positive buzz around brands that donate relevant products to fight COVID-19 like LVMH, manufacturing hand sanitizer? Does it really uh, translate into business profits? That's a very good question. Uh, we, I don't have the data with me, uh, but in those cases, what matters is the way it's been communicated. We've had similar cases in the past where actually, uh, if the company is seen to have had a, an authentic and genuine approach, it's gonna have a positive effect, right? If the company is seen to have just kind of surfed on the trend, uh, the effect is going to be negative. Uh, we've studied that uh, a bit more precisely on, on Black Lives Matter, for instance, right? Uh, on Black Lives Matter, Matter some companies have been seen uh, to be uh, acting and reacting very well, and others uh, with the same message um, have been judged very negatively. So I don't have the data with me, but this is definitely something then that we can look at um, on, on a daily basis uh, with specific brands in mind and looking at uh, how much press has relayed the message and, and whether the buzz actually has been positive or negative. Next question that we have is, does UCAP actually see an increase in business during COVID-19 and other crises <laughs> to help guide business leaders? Um, it's, we are actually, the fact that we are an online company, right? We are only online, we've been much less affected than our competitors. Do we see an increase in, uh, on, in business? Well, I, I wish we would, but, but no. I mean, a lot of our, of our clients are, are actually uh, posing uh, a lot of their investments. So the good thing is, of course, we are not only selling data related to advertising or, or business effectiveness, and a lot of clients are actually interesting to understand what people think uh, more broadly. Uh, but yeah, uh, I would say we've been much less affected than our competitors, but to see, uh, yeah, not, not an increase in business. Not, we're not there yet. This question that we have is, have you compared your COVID data with other crises such as SARS or even the financial crisis? Are these reactions similar? Good question. Uh, I know we have. I've seen some, uh, some articles around that. Um, uh, the, what I remember from, from this data is actually the, the main difference, as you can guess, is that this crisis is A, global, and has been actually affecting every country, every brand, every market at the same time, or roughly at the same time. 
while actually the other crises have been much more staggered or localized. What we have studied in particular is the way the population has reacted. Uh, and we were comparing, for instance, uh, the way the population was reacting to uh, public messages around wearing masks and so on. And again here, because of the mass effect and because of the globalization of the messages, because of the fear actually that it was not only uh, something local, but it was touching everyone, we've seen a much bigger reaction to uh, those messages. Actually, those message, uh, messages have been much more followed uh, than, than during the previous crisis. Next question we have is, how do you manage to separate impact of events such as security laws and COVID-19 in Hong Kong? There could be biases in the survey interpretation. Totally. Uh, actually, we don't, and I would say you should not. Because at the end of the day, what is important is to understand the consumer feelings at a certain point of time, the consumer reaction. The consumer reaction in a certain point of time is never affected by only one thing. If you think about buzz, for instance, buzz is this very general question. Have you heard something positive or negative about the brand? This positiveness or negativeness can be coming from many things, right? It can be coming from financial statements issued by those companies. Um, an article in the press about a bad experience in a McDonald's restaurant. Advertising. So there's always a combination of positive and negative messages. And then we're able to look at the net effect. However, though, if we want to differentiate, what we are looking at is the trend, right? So the trend, if you think about the context in Hong Kong, uh, those, uh, the social unrest has been happening for many months. And of course, we'd be seeing spikes when, when those events uh, are, are more visible. But if you have two events happening exactly at the same time, I think what is important is to understand the net effect. Uh, we really often get those, those questions from our, from our clients. Uh, and, and I'm a firm believer that actually we always have to think that as, as an individual or as a consumer, I'm always reacting to multiple messages. Uh, if you want to assess the impact of your advertising, you absolutely need, absolutely need to take into account the fact that the context is changing. The context is changing all the time. So your advertising could be great, but if there's bad press at the same time, you're going to have an effect that is, uh, that is a bit uh, more negative. So, so long answer to a short question, but I would say uh, we, we, we shouldn't try to isolate too much. There's ways to isolate, right? You can ask many, many questions, follow-up questions and pin, pinpoint, but to me, the net effect is really what is important uh, in, in driving marketing strategies. So this is the last question from our participants. Uh, he's asking if you have any insights on consumer readiness to adapt to a more digital lifestyle, such as going uh, using remote work, online shopping, payments, post-crisis. Yes, uh, we've done uh, a lot of surveys actually around this topic, both internally in this kind of tracker, but as you can guess, uh, we also have clients asking those, those kind of questions. Uh, we have also uh, linked with the press uh, to, to understand that. Um, I invite you guys to look at the YouGov Asia Pacific LinkedIn page because there's actually uh, some data around that. And I've got some, some data from France recently. So the big picture is that a lot of people have embraced uh, the work from home concept. Uh, a lot of people have embraced that. And when we started tracking a, a, and surveying actually those people, uh, everyone was enthusiastic, right? There was probably a couple of weeks of adaptation and people were very enthusiastic about it. What we can see now is that it starts to, uh, there starts to be a fatigue around that. So people are telling us uh, in a nutshell, yes, I want the work from home to be part of the new default, but I can't do that all the time. Uh, and there's actually another layer of fear because a, a lot of companies have been announcing uh, that they would keep working from home for many months uh, until probably the end of the year and more. And, and now people are a bit scared about it because they realize somehow what they've lost. 
Um, if you're interested, I can share more data because we have published uh, some of this data actually across the globe. Thank you, Julian. This ends our Q&A session. I'd like to thank Julian for taking the time out to speak about this topic and for sharing such interesting insights regarding COVID-19 from his company's accumulated data. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here with uh, all the ESSEC folks. Thank, thank you, guys. You. This concludes the end of our webinar. Thank you very much to our participants as well. And I wish you all a great day ahead, guys. Bye-bye. Have a good Bye -bye. weekend. Thank you.